before I just elaborate on what the day has in store, I would like to express my thanks to you all for coming so early on a working morning. Um, and it is not too often that we in Mumbai get to see so many experts, especially from the Delhi-dominated subjects like global economy, geopolitics, and geoeconomics, under one roof in our city. And so I think it's a, it's, this itself is a very special thing for us. And I cannot thank all of our distinguished speakers enough for being so generous with their time to make this day special for all of us. So without making any elaborate uh, remarks, and as I've just mentioned, uh, we have quite a remarkably distinguished set of speakers for the entire day, the, all the sessions that will follow. Uh, I would like to give an overview of the day's proceedings. And after this brief uh, inaugural session, uh, which will just happen after I finish, uh, the working sessions to follow will focus on our four themes that are central to not just India and Japan bilateral relations, but also how our mutual relations are critical for Asia and Asia Pacific, and of course globally, especially with the fast changing geopolitical and geostrategic scenario in the 21st century. The first session will dwell on economic cooperation. The second session will deal with security, peace, and prosperity in Asia and Asia Pacific. The third will dwell on soft power, which I have always believed to be at the very core of friendly relations between any two nations, exploring how to further strengthen India's and Japan's civilizational, cultural, spiritual, and creative and artistic bonds of a common civilizational legacy. We will end the, the day's proceedings with something that is one of India's, and especially urban India's, biggest challenge, uh, infrastructure and smart cities. Uh, I would want to really express my thanks to uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Mr. Jagdish Khattar, Mr. Shekhar Viswanathan, uh, Dr. Rajit Ranade, uh, Mr. Mayur Shah, and Ambassador Aftab Seth, who will be uh, participating in our first session. Dr. Rajiv Kumar chairs the first session. And I now invite uh, Honorable Consul General of Japan, Mr. Yoshiaki Ito, to give his inaugural remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Desai, Senior Fellow of the World Research Foundation in Dubai, and uh, Mr. Sudhir Dwar Kulkarni, Chairman of the World Economic Bank. Dear uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, Namaste. Morning. Uh, my name is Ito. Uh, my son name is Ito. My first name is Yoshiaki. Right now, I was told that my, my first name is Yoshiaki is a little bit uh, hard to pronounce Yoshiaki. So that please call me Ito. Ito is uh, easy. And uh, yes, Ito san is easy. Uh, especially that for Indian people, ITO is uh, very easy to remember because uh, ITO stands for India Tax Office. <laughs> or the income tax office, so that uh, you can imagine how I am uh, infamous in India. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on this special occasion. It is my great honor to be able to address at this opening of the Indian-Japan Cooperation Conference organized by ORF Mumbai. Our two nations, Japan and India, move just about into the next phase of a deepening engagement. The, this flyer uh, distributed in advance from ORF Mumbai uh, says, touching upon clearly that point, saying, quote, 
friendship between India and Japan has long history rooted in spiritual affinity and strong cultural and civilization ties. Our two ancient but modern nation states have carried on the positive legacy of the old association, which has been strengthened by shared value of belief in democracy, individual freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. Today, India is the largest democracy in Asia, while Japan the most prosperous. The special strategic and global partnership can be strengthened through not just a higher quantum of bilateral economic cooperation, but also stronger people-to-people -people contracts and cultural exchange." Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, India is now the most important global partner for Japan in Asia. At the outset of the Japan-India summit meeting, September 2014, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said that relationship between Japan and India, two major democracies in Asia, is blessed with the largest potential for development. If we look up into our history, India and Japan goes a long way. We share universal values such as democracy, human security, and the governance by rule of law. The progress of Japan-India relationship during the last decade has been transformative, and we are now enjoying a very close relationship in many areas, but not the time of conferences yet. Ladies and gentlemen, high-level exchanges are taking place at a larger scale and a higher frequency than never before. The Japanese embassy in Delhi and all the consul general office in India, including mines in Mumbai, have been extremely busy receiving delegations right now. This is a good sign as it means relationship between us is closer and closer than ever before. The latest event was, of course, the visit of Japanese Prime Minister Abe to India, Baranasi, which took place just one and a half months ago in December last year. During the visit, the two prime ministers has resolved to transform the Japan-India Special Strategic and Global Partnership, a key relationship with the largest potential for growth into a deep, broad-based and action-oriented partnership, which reflects a broad coverage of the long-term political, economic, and strategic goals. But do we have any challenge to proceed such deep action-oriented partnership? The two prime ministers had also welcomed the signing of the Memorandum of Cooperation on Introduction of Japan, Japan's high-speed railways, we call HSR, technologies, sometimes we call Shinkansen system, to Mumbai Ahmedabad route. Prime Minister Mori appreciated Japan's consideration of providing highly concessional yen loan for the HSR on Mumbai Ahmedabad route. Both countries will continue to explore this partnership in high-speed railways, which is a high-technology area with the potential to transform India's transportation sector. But is it enough for Japan to provide only only such high-tech gears, what Japan can do more to transform the huge, important India's transportation sector? Regarding economic relationship at their meeting in September 2014, as I mentioned, promised Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Modi announced the Japan-India Investment Promotion Partnership. 
both countries have established concrete targets of doubling Japan's FDI and the number of Japanese companies in India and realizing 3.5 trillion yen of public and private investment and the financing from Japan to India, both within five years. Recent figures have shown robust Japanese investment trend. According to the Minister of Commerce and Industry Japan, Japanese FDI in the first half of fiscal year 2015 is estimated to be 1.1 billion US dollars. The number of Japanese companies in India had also reached 1,229 in 2015. On top of that, India has been one of the largest recipients of Japanese Official Development Aid, ODA, since 2003. But is it really that all the investment or financing are successful ones? Ladies and gentlemen, in December 2015, the two prime ministers underlined the need for closer coordination and effective communication bilaterally and with partners to addressing, address existing and emerging challenges in the sphere of society, stability, and sustainable development. The collection, sphere of security, stability, and sustainable development. They underline their determination to expand cooperation with other partners and enhance connectivity in the Indo-Pacific region. Japan and India will work to strengthen regional economic and security forums and coordinate their action to tackle global challenges, including the rehaul of the United Nations, climate change, as well as terrorism. But can we offer together more for the world, not only to such a standing and familiar global agendas? As a junior, junior diplomat, I must say, welcome all this development, but I sincerely wish that today's conference will bring one step further more about positive impact for the future further strengthening relationship of both countries. <coughs> Genuine friend is not the friend under the fair weather time just laughing, but the one who frankly criticizes the weak point of others. I really hope this conference become such step forward. Thank you very much. Yoshiaki Ito, Consul General of Japan in Mumbai, other consular officials from Japan, and we have uh, some <coughs> consular representatives from uh, China and Russia also here, and perhaps from some other countries. I welcome them all. Distinguished participants in this conference, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <coughs> it gives me great pleasure to join my colleague Thawal Desai in welcoming you all once again for this conference. I especially welcome and thank those participants who have taken the trouble of coming from outside Mumbai. And there are many distinguished participants that I see here who have uh, contributed to India-Japan cooperation in very significant ways. Japan is an old and valued friend of India. And ORF Mumbai has organized several events to promote this friendship. When Japan was hit by three cascading tragedies in March 2011, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown, <clears throat> we invited Japan's then ambassador, Mr. Akitaka Saiki, 
to give a talk on conquering the calamity, how Japan rose to the challenge. Later that year, we organized a roundtable discussion on India-Japan India mutual rediscovery through creative industries. Our dear colleague Radha Vishwanathan, who departed from this world a fortnight back, produced an excellent report on this subject, and I'm told that it has been distributed to you. We fondly remember Radha today. <clears throat> Earlier in 2006, I had an opportunity to meet His Excellency Shinzo Abe during his first term as Prime Minister in Tokyo. I interviewed him for the Indian Express. <clears throat> Among the questions I put to him was this. Your Excellency, I have heard that you are a gifted painter. Now that you are the Prime Minister of Japan, how would you like to see the painting of India-Japan partnership in the coming years? His answer was concise, just a one-liner, but it said it all. Prime Minister Abe said, I quote, if I were to paint a picture of Japan-India partnership, it would be one full of energy and looking to the future with confidence, unquote. All the participants in this conference will agree that Prime Ministers Narendra Modi and Shinzo Abe are adding new energy to this painting of India-Japan cooperation, as a result of which this partnership is now looking to the future with greater confidence. Today's conf conference is meant to take a look at the new colors and bold brush strokes of this painting, of this evolving painting, and also to deliberate on what more needs to be done to make this partnership more vibrant, more useful for our two countries, and also more positive and meaningful for Asia and the world. As two major nations of the world, India and Japan have been steadily strengthening the global and strategic dimensions of our partnership. Friends, Japan has captured the imagination of common Indians in a very special way. <clears throat> Rising from the ashes of the Second World War and the destruction caused by the dropping of two atom bombs, Japan became a byword for national reconstruction through the collective energies of the entire population. Japan quickly became a synonym for high-tech innovation and quality. In recent decades, several other countries in Asia have emerged as hubs of technological innovation, quality, mass manufacturing. To some extent, Japanese economy and Japanese society have faced challenges in recent decades. However, Japan has time and again demonstrated that it has a reservoir of limitless resilience. This resilience is a highly admirable quality. Along with resilience, Japan has cultivated many other qualities that not only command our admiration, but are also worth learning from. Perhaps there is no other country that values conservation of its heritage as much as Japan does. Perhaps there is no other country in the world that values cleanliness as much as Japan does. Perhaps there is no other country in the world that values subtlety and simplicity, shibui, in everything it does as much as Japan does. Subtlety in Japan's enormous aesthetic richness. Also, perhaps there is no other rich country in the world where the wealthy people do not flaunt their wealth. It is for this reason that Japan provides us with many important elements for an alternative paradigm of wealth creation and development. It is for this reason that Japan, India has much to benefit from this partnership, whether it is Shinkansen or Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, whether it is disaster prevention management or sustainable development. Of course, Japan too might find that it has much to benefit from an India that is far more resurgent now than before. India is making renewed efforts to overcome the inherited challenges of poverty alleviation, employment generation, bridging the social and regional imbalances, 
and of course the new challenge of environmental protection and regeneration. India is changing rapidly. India's place in the world and India's voice in the world have become far more important than before. Therefore, it is only natural that Japan should be viewing India as a far more important partner than before. And as uh, Consul General said, the most important international partner in Asia. In this new phase of India-Japan partnership, friends, it is necessary that our two countries take necessary steps to assure all countries in Asia and elsewhere that our partnership is not directed against any other country in the world, in Asia or in the world. Also, the role of other countries outside Asia, in my view, should be constructive and not divisive. In their most recent joint statement in December last year, Prime Ministers Modi and Abe have rightly called for a peaceful, open, equitable, stable and rule-based order in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. India wants to see that Japan's issues with its neighbours are resolved peacefully, just as India itself wants its issues with all its neighbours resolved peacefully. Collective cooperation, collective security, collective development and collective progress, this alone can be the path for Asia's rise. And this alone can be the path towards peace, stability and progress in Asia and the world. The ancient wisdoms and spiritual traditions of India and Japan command our leaderships and our two peoples to follow this path of a network of neighborhood cooperations. Therefore, India, Japan, China, Russia and other countries in Asia, all of us should work together for common good for the good of Asia and the good of the world. I am sure that today's conference will enrich our understanding on many aspects of India-Japan cooperation. The Observer Research Foundation Mumbai intends to transmit this understanding in the form of a report to the Government of India. Welcome once again all of you. I thank the Japanese Consulate in Mumbai for their valuable cooperation in organizing this conference. Thank you, Dhanyavad. Um, before we begin the, the first session, I would request Mr. Sudhindra Kulkarni to uh, present a token of, of our appreciation to the Honorable Consul General. It's a commemorative small thing that we have made. Please. 